Welcome, members of the Assembly, to this recorded session in which representatives of three organisations who have made submissions to you, which you have, uh, will expand on them briefly and on what they see as the main point, their main messages. Uh, the two of them will talk to you about the uh, constitutional issue, but we'll come to that in a moment. So first of all, on the issue of carers and caring, uh, the first person we're going to hear from is Zoe Hughes of Care Alliance Ireland. Zoe. Um, thank you very much uh, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today on the topic of gender and family care. So for those of you who don't know, Care Alliance Ireland is the national umbrella organisation for not-for-profit groups who support family carers across Ireland. We have close to 100 member organisations um, at national and local level who provide services and supports for Ireland's close to 500,000 family carers and those that they provide care for. Um, I suppose if I were to ask you to picture a family carer, uh, I'd imagine that you would describe a woman probably in her 40s or 50s, maybe into her 60s, caring for an aging relative, so maybe a parent or a parent-in-law. Um, and while that is the most likely scenario, the key thing that I would like to impress upon you today is that there is diversity within family care and that when we think of gender and family care, we, we really have to remember that. Um, just about 40% of family carers are male, according to the last census, and we don't really have a clear idea of how many family carers in Ireland might identify, say, outside that gender binary. Um, caring has historically been a gendered activity, and still most of the significant care work is provided by women. So more in hours of intensive caring carried out by them across the board. I could speak for a really long time about gender and family care, um, but I know we're short on time today. So uh, there are sort of three key recommendations that I'd like to make just in my short time speaking here today. Um, so firstly, the thing that we would we would really like to see happen is the national care strategy to be updated. It's the guiding policy document that concerns family carers. And it was last, it was published in 2012 during the financial crisis as a cost neutral strategy. Um, and we very much believe that the time has come to update, modernize, and indeed to fund its actions. Um, this has been committed to within the program for government, uh, which we're really happy about, but we're just really keen to make sure that that does take place and that it's meaningful um, and that the action that come out of it and that are part of it in the next iteration make sense for our current time. Secondly, uh, care needs to be thought of as an activity which, yes, is predominantly undertaken by women, but supports and services really need to be gender proofed to ensure that male and non-binary carers are also encouraged to seek the appropriate supports for their particular needs. Um, and just uh, the last point I'd like to make in my short time is we recommend that uh, Article 41.2 be amended but not deleted uh, in order to remove the legislative and policy assumption that caring is undertaken by women in the home, um, really to acknowledge the diversity of care provided uh, across the country. So thank you. Oh, all right, Zoe, thank you. Can I just put one matter arising uh, from what you've just said, and that is this refreshed Absolutely. national care strategy. Have you any idea what it would cost? And would you have anything to say to the Assembly about priorities in relation to that? So I'm actually really glad you asked me that question because we are very keen in Care Alliance around the idea of involving family carers in the policy matters that are affecting them. So we're actually currently working on some research that will ask family carers, policy makers, um, what they think are the most relevant actions that could be included in the next strategy. We think it nearly needs to come from them to see what's relevant. All right. OK, I'll stop you there and I'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, we're also joined by Orlo O'Connor of the National Women's Council. Uh, and, and Orlo, how would you sum up the document you've made, the message, the core message in that document you want to put to the Assembly? Yeah, well, thanks, Cahill, and also to the citizens, because it's a real privilege um, to address the Citizens' Assembly. And the National Women's Council called for a Citizens' Assembly on care because we believe that care is so critical for our society. And at some point in all our lives, we will give and or receive care. And I think never have we so clearly seen the importance of care for our society and for our well-being than what we're currently experiencing at the moment in, in the COVID crisis. But in this conversation, we really do need to look at the reality of care. And, and the first, I think, thing to say about that is the gendered nature of care. And that it is women who are providing the vast majority of care, whether it's paid or unpaid care. 
And that has a significant impact on women's lives and on the decisions that women can take in their lives. And it's one of the reasons for gender inequality in our society. The second point on this reality is that we have seen through decades a minimal level of state involvement and state support for care. And that is so critical in this conversation because what has happened is it's been left up to women within families to provide care. And it's also been left up to the private market to provide care, often at very high cost. And the impact of that has been a very undervalued and underpaid workforce. We've seen six in 10 of early years workers are paid below the minimum wage. And for domestic and personal care workers, they're often reliant on very precarious contracts and are vulnerable to exploitation. And the majority of those are migrant workers. So that's why we believe that the Citizens' Assembly provides such an important opportunity for change, because we really do need to address significant change in the area of care. So for us in the National Women's Council, what we would like to see come out of the Citizens' Assembly is that in the first instance, we need to see a change in these gendered patterns of care. And how we do that is we start from the top start at our constitution and we change the value in our constitution with regard to care and then we need to do it through our legislation and our policies and services and primary to that is providing a comprehensive public model of early years and out of school hours care and secondly it's about universally investing in care services for older people and disabled people across our lifespan so that people can make real decisions and live autonomous lives in the way in which they want to. Right, can a matter arising from that directly, when the Assembly will have to consider, this is a very, very improved uh, and more expensive level of public service that you're proposing in relation to care. Mm -hmm. uh, and childcare in particular. Uh, would you like the Assembly to make any recommendations on in relation to the cost of this or the priorities of what should be uh, dealt with first and spent on first? Well, I think, I mean, one of the things with regard to early years is that there is a fairly co you know, comprehensive recommendation that countries should be spending 1% of GDP in terms of early years and out of school hours care. And, and so we would recommend that. Right now, Ireland has one of the lowest spends across the EU and across the OECD. So in a principled way, the Citizens' Assembly can recommend that type of investment. And also, you know, when we're looking at that, you know, universal services with regard to care for older people and disabled people, yes, we want to see significant investment because of the low level and the low base in which we're coming from. And I think it is important that the Citizens' Assembly would make recommendations in that regard. Thank you, Orla. Um, Tanya Ward of the Children's Rights Alliance, what would you like to say to the Assembly about the core message in the document yes. that you've sent to them? Well, look, Cahill, we're delighted to be here because we know that countries with the best gender equality policies generally have the best policies for children and young people. And in our submission, we've chosen to focus on two areas. One is around ensuring parents have the opportunity to spend at least the first year of a child's life at home, because we know largely children do best when they get to be with their parent in that first year of life. Uh, and we've made very specific recommendations in relation to that. But in the long term, we should be looking, could we get to best in class? Could it be up to two years? We could get to two years over a certain period of time. The other focus in our submission is around early years. And historically, Ireland has, has, has not paid enough attention to early years education. Back in the 40s, back in the 50s, other European countries were developing their early year systems. And what happened in Ireland was private provision arose. Um, and despite many reforms that have happened over the last 10 years, we now have, as Orla has said, some of the highest childcare fees in Europe. We have serious issues with relation to access and quality. And we also have a situation where a quarter of the staff um, leave their job every year due to paying conditions. And this is actually detrimental to children because children really benefit when they have a good core relationship with the people caring with for them, the people they see every day, and that the staff actually have good quality uh, qualifications and training and conditions. We know the cost of poor quality childcare. Many of the assembly members will have seen the prime time reports and see the impact that they that 
poor quality childcare has in children. So the Citizens Assembly has a crucial role here and can make recommendations uh, to, let's say, bring us to the next level of development because we are concerned that perhaps the big decisions that need to be made into childcare may not be made. Um, we think the hallmark of the best system, the best in class, is a public childcare system where most of the providers, uh, not all, are delivering quality childcare, they can't drive up large profits, and where the staff are valued and where childcare is free for the, the poorest and the low income people in our society. Right, can it directly arising from that, what you would have to say, I want to say to members of the Assembly about the cost of your proposals, and yeah. whether you think the Assembly should deal with this in terms either of uh, what they recommend or what they recommend as a priority. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly recommend to the Assembly to deal with cost because we need as much drivers in this area as possible. To ensure parents can be with their children in the first year of life, you're talking about another 124 million investment. But in terms of childcare, Orla's given you the figures, you're talking about at least another half a billion investment to even get to that 1% of, uh, of GDP. Now, there are some big things the state needs to think about because if we're just incrementally investing in childcare over the years, it will take us a very long time to get to best in class. They do need to look at uh, reinvesting from other areas. So the countries with the best outcomes for children, children go to school at the age of six, they don't start at five. Should we be deciding that in Ireland? And then the and funds we invest into junior infants goes into preschool instead. Looking at child benefit, um, Ireland traditionally has put money into the child benefit payment. Our view is perhaps do you reduce it to some degree, um, increase a higher payment for low income families, and then any of the money left over, you reinvest it into the early years area. Um, we have cut child benefit in the past, but what we did was we paid bank debt with it. We should have invested it into our childcare system. All right. Thank you, Tanya. Now, can I just turn to the issue of Article 41.2 and whether and how it should be amended? And Zoe and Orla, I know, want to put a point to the member, points to the members of the Assembly on this. So, Zoe, what do you have to say about Article 41.2? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I mean, I suppose really what we want to just say is that it's the assumption that women are the ones who should be responsible for providing care in the home, not just to children, but to adults too, has kind of is, is kind of enshrined in that in that article. So this has put pressure on women who don't wish to provide the care um, and also on men who do want to, but also don't want to face the stigma that can coincide with men deviating from that traditional breadwinner role. So we would we would think that deleting the amendment rather than changing it would do away with the um, acknowledgement of the contribution of family carers in the founding policy document of the state. Um, and to us, that's that's just not appropriate. Um, you know, amending it would help to reconceptualise care away from that gender binary and away from the gendered nature of care and to kind of acknowledge different types of scenarios of care that are already happening. Brothers caring for sisters, spouses caring for each other, and those caring across kind of multiple generations. So that's what we that's what we have have seen um, around Article forty one point two from a family carer perspective. All right, thank you. Um, I know Orla that the National Women's Council document, as members of the Assembly will see, has actually a, a suggested uh, amendment to Article forty one mm -hmm. to talk about what change you want and why. Yeah, I mean, this is really important to all nearly 200 members of the National Women's Council around the country. And we firmly believe that Article 41.2 needs to absolutely be removed. It's sexist, it's outdated, it doesn't reflect the diversity of women's lives, and it doesn't, fa it, it doesn't refer to the responsibilities of men with regard to care. It's also contained within an article that's also not reflective of the diversity of families in our society. So in, in the first instance, we believe that a new article should be included, but that recognises the value of care, the intrinsic value of care to the common good of our society. So it's not about a particular part of care or carers, it's about saying that care in and of itself is important and needs to be valued within our constitution and absolutely needs to be written in in a gender neutral way. And because, you know, the constitution sets the values and principles for society. And if we can do that at a top level, then we can follow with the legislation, the policies and services that need to come from that. So I suppose that, you know, this is a really historical moment, I think, in terms of the Citizens' Assembly furthering that agenda for, um, for our society. All right, thank you. 
Thank you, Orla. Of course, this is an issue which is going to be discussed at a later session uh, of the Assembly, but Orla and Zoe wanted to make a point points to you on, on, on the Constitution. To sum up, knowing uh, as we do that citizens' assemblies can make recommendations are either long-fingered, which are shelved, or in some cases actually implemented, what would you have to about what do you really want to come from this Assembly? It, this is a brief question, it will need a brief answer, but what do you see as the, really the core message that would be, that you'd be happy with? Uh, um, Tanya, first of all. Well, look, uh, I'd love to see children, uh, when it comes to care, being put first and care being designed in their best interest. So ensuring parents get to spend that first year with their child, ensuring that childcare provides the best quality for children, um, and also ensuring that we do actually make good public investment into those services because we know it del delivers the best outcomes for children. We shouldn't be afraid of that and we shouldn't shy away from that. Zoe, what's your closing message? Uh, my closing message would be just to remember and to remind people that, um, and I neglected to mention this, is that uh, family carers in Ireland provide a well in excess of 10 billion euros worth of care to the exchequer and to remember that when we're looking at budgeting for a, a maybe a new care strategy or how we invest and how we look at care and conceptualize it it's a huge value to society and we mustn't forget that and Orla of the national women's council how would you like to sum up what you want this assembly to do in brief well I think the first thing to say is that we know that the issue of care is complex, but there are very clear solutions that are being put forward to the Citizens Assembly. And primary to those is public investment in comprehensive public services that recognises the importance of care, whether that's in relation to children, disabled people or older people. And that's what's needed is that comprehensive model of public services. All right. Well, thank you very much, Orla and Tanya and Zoe, who are very much sort of speaking on the documents which they have submitted to members of the Assembly. And it just remains for me to thank the three of you uh, for speaking this, to this session and to wish you, the members of the Assembly, all the very best in your really important work.